Um, I feel very comfortable following John because I've got qualifications from universities in law, history, and theology. So let's see if we can get them all together, which is great. Um, so I, my, I, I, I read the longer text that John um, presented to us, and, and I would want to make some remarks on that, not just specifically on the ones that have been presented uh, in that fine presentation just now. So that whilst New Zealand doesn't have a, an entrenched constitutional document of the sort that the United States and Canada, uh, and in some respects Australia have, we do have a constitutional canon. And in the judgments of our courts and the development of government policies pertaining to elements of our constitutional canon, I think we would certainly all do well to take note of the sort of arguments that John has advanced and will be advancing when this work is, is published. And so I'd like to uh, make two main points and then foreshadow uh, what I would like to write up for in any publication emerging from this symposium, subject, of course, always to peer review. Um, so first, I agree strongly with John's argument that the purported refusal of, a, of Canada's um, higher courts to espouse originalism of the variety found in some United States Supreme Court judgments disguises a very real form of Aboriginalism uh, in Canada. The content of Indigenous rights enforceable in Canadian courts are elaborated with reference to an historic point of time, such as first contact with European colonisers or a presumed date of British sovereignty being asserted. I think the Adams case, the people there had to find out what they were doing in 1603, um, and uh, that is a, uh, a form of originalism. The living trees approach, which John didn't address uh, in his talk now, but which uh, features significantly in the paper, uh, the uh, Canadian approach to a constitution as a living tree that can grow and evolve um, uh, is uh, regularly applied uh, in, in Canada in other respects, uh, but not applied to Section 35 uh, recognition of um, Indigenous uh, uh, Native rights in the Constitution Act of 1982 and First Nation treaties and so on. So I thoroughly agree with John when he says some kind of legal vacuum must be imagined to create the Crown's radical title. And the Crown's radical title is one of my pet hates. Um, in fact, neither Canadian nor New Zealand jurisprudence is as far away from the terra nullius, so-called terra nullius, concept uh, of pre Marbo number two Australian law as some of us would like to imagine. Over the decades, I've consistently argued, but not with much success, that the Simons decision in 1847 was based precisely on such an assumed vacuum and bolstered by Chief Justice Marshall's reliance on the doctrine of discovery in Johnson and McIntosh in 1823, just as the Guerin 1984 decision of the the Supreme Court of Canada, noted by John, also relied on discovery to give ultimate radical title to the Crown. Um, on, on that Simons case, um, Chief Judge Jury, as he then was in 1983, in the first substantive Waitangi Tribunal report, said the Māori had gone to court many times and the score was about 60 to the settlers and one to Māori. And the one to Māori was Simons, and he was completely wrong in my view. Um, Justice Williamson reinforced that in the Tuwehi case in 1986 when picking up on the young Paul McHugh, as opposed to the present Paul McHugh, um, <laughs> uh, he, um, he uh, said the Simons case was when we was all things were hunky-dory, relations between Māori and Pākehā were really great, and then bad things happened and we Parata came along. Um, I think that Simons is just as bad as we Parata because it's based on that core legal vacuum idea that Crown radical title appeared without asking anyone about it. So I agree with John that it's time to reject such archaic and misguided customs and traditions. That's his words. Um, and uh, my application of that here is that we should reject the reasoning of the Simons judgments uh, as in any way progressive for the constitutional canon of 21st century New Zealand. We should think of that as it was intended, I think, 
uh, to apply New Zealand company thinking of the 1840s arguments uh, with the colonial office that have been referred to in earlier remarks this morning. Um, based on Johnson and McIntosh, explicitly to reject any major legal or political significance for the Treaty of Waitangi, minimise the Treaty of Waitangi and advance settler entitlements to Crown grants based on the Crown's alleged radical title. So that's the 1847 uh, Simon's point. Such rights as the colonial Aboriginal rights doctrine has bestowed were subsumed under the ultimate title of the Crown and respected only for so long as the Crown chose to respect them. Instead, I suggest, the starting point for the elucidation of Māori customary rights should be the values and conceptual regulators of tikana Māori um, that comprise the first legal system, the first rail, um, rusty or not rusty, um, uh, as um, informing the contents of our contemporary constitutional canon. A living tree approach advocated for by John would find ways and means to give substance to tikana as a primary source of the New Zealand common law, as well as informing the evolving content of the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi to be found in many enactments. So, like John, I would urge that the growth of indigenous rights may be sourced less in founding intentions and more in contemporary documents. The United States, uh, United Nations, sorry, uh, General Assembly Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is one such document that has already received tentative support in some, United States, in some New Zealand Supreme Court dicta, uh, most recently Paki No. 2. In this respect, I'm challenged um, I, by uh, Kirsty uh, Gover's paper, which you're about to hear, uh, and I'd like to hope that in a liberal democracy uh, of today, we would prefer a more consensual type of document, uh, like the Treaty of Waitangi or the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, rather than the non-consensual uh, imposition of radical title and the reasoning of Simons. So that was my first point. My second one uh, is to say that whilst I agree with much of John's critique of originalist fiction, there is an important dose of originalist fact that I now believe should be given weight in the context of New Zealand. Unlike my consistent view on the Simons case and Aboriginal title over many years, I have an extremely checkered record on the proper understanding of and interpretation of the Treaty of Waitangi. I stand before you as a living fossil. Um, when, when I completed my Dar es Salaam PhD uh, in 1983, I was still wearing a badge that asserted the treaty is a fraud. And being an historian, I should advance the evidence. There is the document. It says the treaty is a fraud. I bought this from the Waitangi Action Committee in 1976, and I still have it. Um, and at that time, I, I wrote um, that the um, imposition of British sovereignty over New Zealand could not be justified by the recognised grounds of international law, discovery, cession, occupation of vacant territory. It was simply an imperialist usurpation, wresting control from Māori. As the political tide turned in the mid-1980s to honour the treaty, so I turned. I picked up, as most of us in what became the treaty industry did, the line adopted by Ruth Ross that Bain referred to earlier uh, in her seminal 1972 New Zealand Journal of History paper. He quoted, uh, I'll summarise it, Bain quoted it, but uh, the treaty was hastily and inex inexpertly drawn up. The English text differed significantly in meaning to that of the Māori text, but the Māori text was the primary text and in the primary language of the time of the majority of the population of the people in the place. Weight should be given only to Tiriti of Waitangi or at least to Tiriti of Waitangi understood in the light of Whakaputanga or Thurangatiratanga or New Tirani, the Declaration of 1835. In recent years, however, whilst engaged in supervising the now Dr. Ned Fletcher, whom you'll hear from shortly, I've become convinced that both of my previous viewpoints are wrong. So I now um, I, I wish to argue that the Y1080 to Paparahi or Turaki report in 2014 
which came out in November 2014, exactly in the same month as Ned Fletcher's thesis was completed finally. Um, uh, I think the tribunal was wrong to continue to follow that Ruth Ross dismissal uh, of the English text, which has been with us uh, since 1972, and in particular since Claudia Orange's book that, again, Bain referred to. Uh, in particular, what they're wrong to do in that report, in my view, is to adopt a synchronic understanding of the word sovereignty. What Crown Council, Claimant Council, and almost all of the expert witnesses put forward was a definition of sovereignty that came not from 1840, nor from 2015 or 2014, but from 1765 uh, in the writings of Blackstone in his commentaries on the Constitution and a definition of sovereignty referring to metropolitan United Kingdom uh, and uh, in the way in which that played out uh, in 1765 was not a subject of any inquiry whatsoever. It was just assumed that what Blackstone said is what English people always mean when they use the word sovereignty anywhere in the world, whether it be um, uh, in Sierra Leone or, or New Zealand or anywhere else at any point in time. So those are the two substantive points I want to make uh, in response to John's uh, most interesting paper. Uh, in the, the written uh, paper I hope to write to follow this, I'd like to stress the significance of papers by Edgar Trevor Williams. Bill Williams, he was known to me. He was the warden of Rhodes House when I was under his care. Later, Sir Edgar Williams. He published two papers uh, in 1940 and 1941, close to the first centenary of the treaty. And Ned uh, looked at those papers and, uh, and, and was most impressed by Williams's um, analysis of James Stephen and the role of the colonial office uh, in relation to New Zealand at the time of the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, in the paper, I'd like to recount some of Bill Williams's connections with New Zealanders in Oxford in the, in the 1930s, uh, particularly the Rhodes Scholars in Oxford in the 1930s, and the 8th Army Intelligence Corps during World War II, which may account for why the then Merton College Junior Research Fellow writing on James Stephen and the colonial office policy uh, that led to the framing of the treaty, uh, came to write those papers. He was married to a New Zealand uh, woman, Monica, uh, and uh, hang out with a lot of New Zealanders. And his paper has hardly been cited since. Uh, it was published in 1940-41. Maybe that's why uh, people didn't look back that far. Uh, but a very, very little uh, reference to it. Uh, and perhaps uh, it would be better if we paid more reference to what Williams wrote in 1940 and 41 than what Ruth Ross wrote in 1972. And um, I would like to humbly endorse the uh, views of Ned Fletcher, whom you're about to hear from, uh, on the compatibility of the Māori and English texts and reject some aspects of the Y1040 reasoning. Um, <clears throat> so I'll conclude that if, according to a proper originalist understanding of both texts of the Treaty of Waitangi, Tikana was not to be replaced entirely by English law, then, using a living tree approach to the constitutional canon, Tikana should be given much greater weight now and in the ongoing future evolution of New Zealand common law. And note dicta in the uh, Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal and decisions indicating that the Superior Courts are already moving in giving uh, greater weight to Tikana in modern New Zealand common law and in law and policy, crafted by people like the present Dean of the Faculty of Law of Victoria University, uh, with respect to the status uh, and governance of Takatai Moana, of the Waikato and, and uh, Wanganui Rivers, of Manamotahake Ongai Tuhoi, uh, being implemented in Tiuruera, because those were examples that Natalie gave uh, this morning. And, uh, and uh, so my hope would be, Bain, that by a little bit of uh, acknowledgement of Ned Fletcher's research and, and, and Bill Williams's work back in the centenary in 1940, we can make some useful history apply. Kia ora koutou.